Okay, we'll call the regular meeting of the Sherman Village Board of Order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Trustee Gray? Yes. Trustee Vaughn? Yes. Trustee Long? Yes. Trustee Rockford? Yes. Trustee Schultz? Yes. Trustee Tim? Yes. President Kafka? Yes. And seven members of the Village Board present, quorum being established, we're going to proceed with the order of business as set forth on the agenda. Um, let me read into the record the date. Today is uh, Tuesday, January 21st of 2020. We're at the Village Hall. The time is 6 p.m. This is a regular meeting of the Sherman, Sherman Village Board of Trustees. Moving along in the opening, we have complied with and already done the roll call, so that brings us to item number two, and that is the Pledge of Allegiance. So if I could ask everybody to stand and face the flag. I please have Mrs. Catherine, could you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance on your cue? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, we need to set the agenda. The agenda has been posted 48 hours in advance of the meeting in accordance with the Open Meetings Act. There can be no, no action items added to the agenda other than emergency action items, of which there are none at this time. But are there any trustees seeking recognition for the purposes of discussion? And please forward those to the chair at this time. See none. Chair, we're going to take a motion to set the agenda. Trustee Gray makes a motion, seconded by Trustee Rockford. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it. The agenda is set. We move to the clerk's report. Item number one, the presentation of the January 7th, 2020. Regular meeting minutes are presented by the clerk for approval. Are there any trustees that <coughs> see any deficiencies, any corrections, errors, anything along those lines? Okay, so they've been sent out uh, to the trustees for review. You sure? You sure guys are <laughs> fans? There's nothing there you want to change? Very fans. Like the Go Vikings. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Somebody want to make a motion to strike that from the minutes? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, we're gonna let them let, let the minutes stand. Such a motion would be out of order. Out of order. <laughs> let them have the fun. <laughs> they're watching the fun. They're going straight. They're going straight. They're going straight. They're going straight. They're not growing the mind. They're growing the brain. Welcome to the show. I think Trustee Hall will make that motion. Oh, right? no. <laughs> Trustee Hall makes a motion seconded by, what's that, Long and Tim? <laughs> Long and Tim? We'll split that one. <laughs> I still don't see what we're talking about. So. <laughs> All right, Trustee Hall, I'm going to take the second. All right, uh, uh, let's see. I need a roll call, right? Roll Trust, call. Trustee Gray? Yes. Trustee Hall? No, Trustee Hall? Yes. Trustee Long? Yes. Trustee Rockford? Yes. Trustee Schultz? Yes. Trustee Tim? Yes. That's, uh, and I'll vote yes, since the manager has received a uh, uh, majority vote. So that's seven members voting yes, none voting no. The minutes are adopted and we'll be presented on the village website. Uh, for the record, it's under legal report. I just found it. Actually, it's more village. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I know it's graphs and verbal as well. Yeah. Right. All right, let's move along. The bills are presented for approval, right? Correct? Uh, yes. The reports are near the day. Uh, we'll see those the next meeting. Although, payroll. Yeah, payrolls are payrolls. here, so let's just approve the payroll before we the bills. Okay. Uh, motion to that effect, Trustee Gray makes a motion seconded by Trustee <coughs> Rockford. Uh, clerk, call the roll. Trustee Gray? Yes. Trustee Long? Yes. Trustee Long? Yes. Trustee Rockford? Yes. Yeah. Trustee Schultz? Yes. Trustee Tim? Yes. Six members voting yes, none voting no. The bills are approved for uh, payment. There is no treasurer's report this evening, so Treasurer Stunkel is not in attendance. Moves us along to the village engineer's report, of which he is not here this evening. No uh, items are on here that, are, that he's needed for. Moves, along, moves us along to the legal report. Counselor, anything? Gone by case. <laughs> right. <laughs> Village Administrator, Economic Development Coordinator. No, I have no report. Okay, so that brings us to the President's report. Uh, we do have a guest in the chamber. 
I'm going to introduce her, Megan Cochran. She's with uh, Sickich. She has been uh, completing our audit for a number of years, has worked under Chad Lucas. Um, she's a partner at uh, Sickich, right? I mean, director. her director. Um, so she's very accustomed and very acclimated to the villages, uh, audits, budgets, and just about everything uh, in between. She's worked uh, hand in hand with Administrator Stratton, uh, uh, Trustee Schultz, uh, Treasurer Stunkel, but she is here this evening to present the audit. The audit is in draft form right now until we accept it, and I've asked her <coughs> to give us the uh, give us a rundown on it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask her. But uh, she's going to power through and hit the high, point, the high points, much like uh, the meeting last year. So with that said, the floor is yours, and uh, please present us the, uh, uh, the audit. Okay. Um, well, once again, like uh, the mayor said, we've worked with the village for um, a number of years, and uh, we want to thank um, the treasurer and um, the village administrator for all their help during the audit process. Um, so I will go through the financial statements and the independent auditor's report first, um, the big, big packet. Um, starting on page one, one through three, is the independent auditor's report. This is the only thing and um, the only information in the audit that belongs to us. Um, we are um, issuing an unmodified opinion. Uh, therefore, the financial statements um, are presented fairly in all material respects in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Starting on page four is the statement of net position of the village. Um, this includes all of your funds and it includes the capital assets and the long-term debt um, within the village. It was uh, fairly consistent from the prior year. Your capital assets decreased slightly due to the depreciation of the capital assets. Um, your long-term debt decreased um, due to repayments on the bonds. Um, so you ended up with a net position. Your net investment and capital assets are about uh, 8.9 million overall, and you have unrestricted net position of a negative uh, 2 million. Um, that's mainly due to the fact that you have bonds that don't relate to specific capital assets, your capital, um, your uh, road construction projects, and um, some of the tech projects uh, weren't capitalized um, based upon the capitalization threshold. Um, page five and six is your statement of activities. It's your income statement essentially, um, shown in a slightly different format. The uh, the statement reads from left to right. So overall for the county, you had a positive change in net position of 475,000. Um, fairly reasonable to the prior year, I think it was about 600,000 um, was your net position increase last year. Uh, starting on page seven is your fund financials. This does not include capital assets. It doesn't include long-term debt. Um, it just includes your funds, your general fund, your TIF funds, your motor fuel tax fund. Um, so page seven includes your assets and your liabilities, your fund balances. Um, your general fund has a fund balance of about one million. Um, so your total fund balance is about 2.3 million overall. Page eight shows the reconciliation of your government-wide financial statements to your fund financial statements. Um, it's just showing that um, your fund balance uh, increases with your capital assets of 9.7 million and decreases with your long-term debt of about 5 million. Uh, page nine is your statement of revenue and expenditures and changes in fund balance for your governmental funds. Uh, you had a, um, a negative change in fund balance of about 3.8 million. Uh, a large part of that is due, due to the motor fuel tax fund your uh, your road projects that you had this year. Uh, page 10 is the reconciliation of the uh, fund financial statements to the government wide, again showing um, the reconciliation of your capital uh, capital assets being capitalized and removed, removed from your expenses and your uh, payments on your long-term debt decreasing your liabilities. Uh, 
page 11, 12, and 13 show information over your sewer fund. Um, that includes your capital assets and your sewer fund. Um, your net position <coughs> for the sewer fund was $1.5 million. Um, that was an increase of uh, 4000 4, um, That changed from the prior year. You had a increase in your net position of $52,000. Um, this year, uh, the consumption decreased slightly and your expenses increased a little bit, your salaries and your supplies. But overall, still an increase in the net position. Um, starting on page 14 is the notes to the financial statements that provides uh, additional information over your accounting policies and over additional and additional information over the balances in the financial statements. Um, so I'll just go through these really quick and just highlight a couple of the key points. Um, page page 23 shows your change in your capital assets. That shows your additions and your deletions and your capital assets during the year. Um, one thing to note is the park was completed, so that moved from construction and progress to, um, to infrastructure and began to be depreciated. Um, then starting on page 26, uh, provides additional information over your long-term debt. It describes uh, descriptions over your notes payable, um, your general obligation bonds. Starting on page nine is your uh, TIP bonds, the limited obligation um, of the TIP bonds that are paid from your incremental taxes, your pledged taxes. Uh, page 31 shows your change in your long-term liabilities. Um, You'll note that you had one note payable that was issued this year for a vehicle, and the rest were payments on your uh, bonds and yeah. your notes. Beginning on page 34 is the budgetary comparison schedule that shows your cash basis expenses compared to your budget amounts um, for the general fund, the TIF fund, and the motor fuel tax fund. We also, also show a reconciliation from the cash basis to the accrual basis that's reported on your financial statements. And then finally on pages 43 through 45 provides some additional information over your TIF funds. Um, it breaks it out from your original TIF, your Route 66, and your Real Point TIF um, shows those funds and the change in fund balance for um, <coughs> and then page, page 45 is the um, management research and over compliance. Um, we noted that they um, complied with the requirements of the uh, TIF Act in all material respects. <coughs> so that was just a very quick overview of the financial statement. So if you have <coughs> any questions, <coughs> Um, any questions now, or if you would like to reach out to me at a later time, um, feel free as you get, after you have a chance to look them over. Any trustees have any questions or statements regarding the audit? Or the or the trustee Schultz? Did, when you uh, did your audit, did you have any issues with any of the staff or were you able to find information about any problem? No, and actually in our required communications to those charged with governance, um, we're required to disclose if we've had any uh, disagreements or any issues during the audit process, and we know none in our in our letter. Okay. So, in your opinion, the information that the treasurer provided you uh, fairly stated the financial condition of the village. Correct. It's, it's my understanding that as auditor, you just simply take the information that we're given, and you. That's why it's, the term was unmodified. You did not change what the treasurer provided. We recommended adjustments, but they weren't material adjustments. Okay. So, and we include in our communication the audit adjustments that were recommended during the audit process. Okay. Any other questions? Any other statements? Um, I was just gonna note too, um, there were two other packets that discussed the um, communication of significant deficiencies and then some advisory comments, management letter comments that we've noted. Um, we've discussed those with, with management and with the mayor, but if you have any um, additional questions over those, 
again, you know, feel free to reach out and um, we can discuss any of those. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody have anything else? Okay. Are you comfortable with accepting the the uh, the audits? And the, Financial statements and independent auditors report as stipulated on the agenda that was posted in the course with this meeting. Everybody comfortable? So you don't need follow up, you're ready to approve it and add it to the village website. So Trustee Schultz will make a motion to accept the audit report as presented. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Second uh, by Trustee Hahn. Uh, Mr. Cook, please call the roll. Trustee Gray? Yes. Trustee Vaughn? Yes. Trustee Long? Yes. Trustee Rapper? Yes. Trustee Schultz? Yes. Trustee Tess? Yes. Six members voting yes, none voting no. The audit is accepted. Uh, and sick of audits, auditors, I imagine they're already getting started on the next year, getting, getting very close, if not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. We, uh, we thank you, you guys do very good work. Um, it's a pleasure working with you. I'm glad that uh, Trustee Schultz you know, asked that question because I've had the pleasure of working with you and I know the staff tries to bend over backwards to get you whatever you need uh, and as timely and as fast a, you know, a motion as they possibly can. So I think we've all worked very well together and gotten that information and had information flow back and forth um, without a hitch. So. Yeah. We always appreciate the, the help of the, the village staff. Always helpful. Yeah. So in case you don't know, they, they park in the, the mayor's office for like several weeks and have access to all the files. And what they can't find, they you know just request and the administrator and other staff will get it for them as best they can. So mm -hmm. um, other than that, tell Chad hello. And <laughs> <laughs> will do. <laughs> uh, we, we thank you for your time. Don't feel like you have to hang out. Uh, the meeting's almost over, but uh, we understand if you want to get on out of here. <laughs> so, that's going to bring us to the next item, which is item number two, and that is the appointment of you? You too. a village clerk. So, with that being said, give me a couple seconds here. So, Mr. Stratton's been acting in the acting in village clerk capacity for a number of, for a, a certain period of time now. Seems like forever. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought about that and actually wanted to, for some time, appoint the village clerk. I feel like now's as good a time as any. Uh, it is the start of 2020. That actually gets you moving on a lot of things. So I feel like it's, you know, I'm going to bring some appointments forward. Our boards and commissions, uh, we need to re-examine, re like, the, the terms on their expiration. So in the near future, I'm going to be bringing reappointments up and new appointments for vacancies that may exist on there. Terms have expired. Individuals can serve past their term when it's expired. The courts do not want vacancies, um, essentially. So individuals, even though their term has expired, if they haven't taken any action to uh, resign or leave that board, they still can continue to stay in that capacity. And I've never asked anybody to leave the board um, or any of the boards. We've had a couple resignations uh, due to people moving out of Sherman, relocations out of state. So I need to find and uh, catalog the exact individuals that are no longer like per se on zoning and planning and revisit whether some of the individuals want to continue serving. So I'm gonna bring that up in the near, in, in the future just so that we uh, have that current. You remember when we did the codification, we went through there and it stipulated the terms like, and we staggered it for the zoning board of appeals because those are seven year appointments. So if somebody was a one year, somebody was a two to get us back on track, well, in a part-time village um, and especially when the village zoning board doesn't meet all that often. Sometimes these things kind of go the wayside. So I want to look at that. I want to ask the administrator uh, to do that research for me. I want to reach out to those individuals and then kind of get us back on the track of who's on there, what, when does their term expire, and stuff like that. So those appointments will be coming forward in the, near, in the somewhat near future. That being said, going back to the village clerk, I've asked uh, somebody that we all know very well and who's active in the community uh, to serve as the village clerk. 
He is employed. Um, he will sit in the village clerk's position. He will be charged with all of the uh, responsibilities of a village clerk statutorily. We'll get him his training, but I'm going to actually recommend, he's in the chamber this evening, I'm recommending and asking for the, uh, the, the consent and his appointment, advice and consent and his appointment, but it's gonna be Sean Bull. Um, let me give you a few bullet points on Sean. Uh, he's married to his lovely wife, uh, Krista. They have two kids, uh, Chandler and Chesney. If you don't know, he's a Kim Chesney fan. <laughs> he's been a member of the Sherman Area Chamber of Commerce, very active in that. Um, done a lot of good things with the chamber, built that up, and his term as president has more recently expired. He has been trying to reinvigorate uh, the Sherman Athletic Club. He's building the membership there, uh, trying to get um, some things going there, and he's off to a good start. It's going to take some energy and take a lot of effort, which I told him, but we would be supportive as best we could. Um, I think he's built up the membership. It's probably too full of what it was down to. Um, he has, uh, let's see, he's been on the chamber what, for five years. Is that right, Sean? Um, couple years as president. He's an insurance agent uh, since 2009. He's a Hope Ambassador. Um, he coaches soccer and his father actually served on the village board some years ago uh, for six years. Um, I know his father very well. He's advised me on a lot of things as I got started. He knows a lot of uh, institutional knowledge regarding the village and has been very helpful in my efforts as a mayor. But that all being said, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Uh, Sean, if you could please come forward to the podium, just stand there, and if any trustees want to ask me any questions, you know, I thank you for, you know, willing for your willingness to serve. I know that you want to be involved, and um, you've, you've, uh, you've shown with your help with the Christmas party. I didn't talk about that either. Sean has been very instrumental in picking up the ball and uh, from Trustee Chirac and running with the Christmas party and organizing a lot of stuff regarding that. That takes a lot of boots on the ground, grunt work to get that going and keep that going and he's added things to that. So he's got the youth, the energy, and the, the smarts and knowledge to you know keep that going and then also assist Mr. Stratton in his uh, duties as administrator. But he'll still staff and be but he'll uh, also perform all the other duties as a side person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said, I don't want to keep the meeting going any longer than it has to. But if you have any questions of Mr. Bull, um, do you have anything that you want that I've left out? <laughs> no, I think we're good. Anybody have anything? Are you comfortable with moving forward? I know I kind of sprung this on you this evening, uh, and that's not by design or anything. It was just things are busy, and I asked him to finally put it on the agenda Friday or whatever. And you know, just, yeah. Is that a full time? Oh no, this is just this is just a part time um, clerk position. Most of the work will actually be done by uh, Administrator Stratton in terms of you know the minutes and stuff like that. Sean will have to be here <clears throat> as the clerk unless you know you know we're having another baby or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll have Mr. Stratton continue to be the acting clerk and fill in his stead in that respect. But uh, he will, there's compensation. It is in the, the village code. But it's completely part time. Um, can you what? Can I just add? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that always comes up in every audit is making sure you have a lot of people who have the ability who are different, uh, sets of eyes on the books, the records, but also more importantly, the signatures. Um, without the clerk, we've been absent an additional signature, which requires a trustee to step forward and that signatory authority. Uh, Sean will be bonded and insured by the village in accordance with our insurance program and he will become a signatory authority on our accounts as well, in addition to the treasurer and the president. And I think, I think, Kevin, don't you have a signatory authority for the time? Uh, I think it's fine. So this helps out this operation to be more efficient and complies with some of the standards that may come up in an audit from time to time. And the IML provides a lot of valuable training, so we'll get him, and, you know, the, the clerk's training when that becomes available. So, <laughs> can't wait. <laughs> with that being said, uh, can I get a motion to nominate Mr. Sean Bull as clerk for the Village of Sherman? Second. 
with the advice and consent. So, uh, uh, Trustee Rockford makes the motion. Is there a second? Seconded by Trustee Gray. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Trustee Gray. Yes. Trustee Long. Yes. Trustee Long. Yes. Trustee Rockford. Yes. Trustee Schultz. Yes. Trustee Tim. Yes. And the measure having received a majority majority vote, allowing the mayor to vote on the prevailing side, I would like to be recorded as a yes as well. So that's seven members voting yes and none voting no. Uh, Clerk Bull, welcome aboard. Thank you. Aww. Appreciate it. Look to see your <laughs> smiling face sitting to my right at the next meeting. Okay, so let's move along. So this is a unique little circumstance that I was presented with uh, a few days ago. Item number three is an ordinance, and the administrator has discussed this with council and discussed this with myself. We have uh, item number three, let me read into the record, a variance to the front yard setback for a property located at 339 and 341 Pentail Drive in Sherman, Illinois. I'm actually gonna kinda turn the floor over to Administrator Stratton for a 101 on the background on this as was presented to me, and then I'm gonna add a few things and we're gonna hopefully pass this. Uh, Don, you wanna take it? Sure. sure. <clears throat> there, this, the the lot we're talking about here is is a uh, zero lot line duplex lot, uh, lot six in Quail Point. Uh, the street address is three thirty nine and three forty one Pintail. It's on a cul de sac, <clears throat> and it's already built. And somebody goofed by two point seven feet on the front yard setback. Um, so this is an ordinance to, to allow a variance of that setback just for that. that one, one side's off 2.25 feet and the other side is off 2.73 feet or whatever number that is. Yeah, so so a building permit was issued all the time the design showed a 30 foot yard setback right. on the road when it's required under ordinance. However, when they went to construction, um, apparently they got closer. Right, just to by the next two point seven feet. Concrete guys? Now they're up, now they're gonna put the property up for sale. <coughs> that requires a survey. They said, well, I think we're a little closer than we think we are, and they discovered in fact they are. So in order for them to sell the property the parcel, they need to make sure that the, they get a variance in order to do this. They have, played, they have paid the appropriate fees associated with any petition that anybody would file, which is a $200 fee. Um, and they've gone through the process kind of backwards, but we're kind of stuck in a very odd situation. I know that there's some other, some other avenue you also want us to kind of look into as well in the future That's in right. dealing with these kind of things, so I'll let you handle that. So when these circumstances arise, and we have a local citizen trying to sell their property, and it comes up in a survey, and then title work is essentially held up, they're looking for a resolution, right? And it's the people that we all potentially, I mean, I don't know them, who it is, basically who it is. I had one meeting with them before. Right. But that aside, these instances have come up from time to time where the builder, had, especially on cul-de-sac lots, and it does get tricky, but they've built over the property lines. And once the house is built, what's our remedy? There really is no remedy. And so when I first got elected some time ago, we did try to put measures in place through updating the building permit application, through adding more levels of the village engineer going out and being more involved in the different processes through the building stages. So now they go out when the foundation for the stakeout, they go out for the footings, they go out for essentially the dig, um, and then on the back end. And the back end used to be the big problem. If you remember, we used to have <coughs> the swales that the developer put in for drainage. <clears throat> Some builders would not haul off the excess dirt. That excess dirt, saving them, say, 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, was spread across the entirety of the yard into the swales, creating 
a bottleneck essentially or a complete dam for the water that was supposed to flow down and exit the subdivision. And then when you come in as mayor and trustees, you basically, there's not a whole lot of remedy for that situation either because you got fences in place, you're crossing <coughs> people's yards, these people are complaining, they don't want their yard tore up, and it was a whole, it's been a whole, it, it's been a huge mess that we've gotten through over some years. But this situation still can pop up from time to time. So my recommendation is, is uh, in council and Administrator Stratton, through our discussions, <clears throat> what are we going to do? We can't make them move the, the house 2.7 feet. We could, or something like that. I don't know what you could do, actually. But, um, right? That's not going to happen. It's not realistic, and we don't want to do that. So, in this instance, we approve it. No harm, no foul. It's going to happen. They have a closing in two weeks or less, February, early February. So to get them through, because if we went through the whole entire, and we discussed this, going through the whole variance process and stuff like that, some technicality like this, and I think we can move forward in terms of statute, and the board has the final binding power anyway. Our uh, zoning boards are advisory in nature and don't have a binding authority. So in this situation, I think it's arguably acceptable that we can approve it tonight get them moving on and sell that. What I do recommend is that we add some, that we take a look at this further, much like we did years ago, and we add something to the building permit process, or we add some kind of uh, penalty that if this happens, somebody has to pay and it goes back on whoever was at fault or the person that has to settle up at that point in time and it becomes part of the transactional process. And it, and it, can't, and it, it needs to be something that's significant. You know, I don't know what that is, if it's a $1,000 fine, a $1,500, $2,000 fine, that's for us to decide. But I don't think it should be nominal in nature because I think we need to fix and remedy this situation so that this stuff doesn't happen in the future. And we need to stipulate on the building permit application, especially for these cul-de-sac lots, you know, this is noted that, you know, if you build outside of the such and such, and when you sign that building from that form, it's kept on file. And then if this happens in the future, because we have, we, we have legal builder, fees, huh? Do we know who the builder was? I don't remember who the builder was. Yeah. I don't Does know. Does it make sense to contact them just to let them know, hey, we're, <coughs> we're going to be looking into seeing the watch? Yeah. Yeah, the builder's done and gone now. They well, yeah. Away. They've left. It's been a no, few years yeah. back. But yeah. Now it's on the owner. Yeah. But he might build around here again. Mm -hmm. Remember several years ago, the board adopted a, uh, we had an issue, of, well, it was before I was here, but I saw the ordinance. I think back in 2015 or 14, you adopted an ordinance because you had issues with people occupying the house before the final inspection, which is kind of critical. Mm -hmm. And that's critical. been another situation. But you adopted an ordinance that had <laughs> heavy penalties. And since you adopted it and it got out to the building trades and everything else, $500 daily fine, not only for the builder, but for the owner of the property who's occupying it. Yeah, that's pretty stiff. We haven't had to issue that because guess what? They're complying with it. This might help, you know, money speaks, I guess, when there's a penalty involved in this nature. So it wouldn't be untoward to charge a penalty of $2,500. Oh, I mean, in, a, something of this nature. in this process, I mean, the mayor knows that, you know, when there's things over a price, it can become nasty between two neighbors and it could literally turn into something. In this situation, it's not going to uh, be a problem. And, you know, the, the variance will be created, but we've had houses that have been built over, you know, the property lines on the other person's property. So we've remedied that with the engineer out there, but we definitely need to uh, look at doing something in this, in this situation. It's likely not gonna happen anymore, but if it does, I think it needs to be something significant to compensate for, you know, the administrative time uh, that is spent dealing with this. That well, means that- And I'll let you open the board also know that the- sorry, was, No, go ahead. Uh, oh. During the building process, one of the inspections that is performed is a foundation inspection. That's where you measure from the road and the side yards mm -hmm. to determine where that's Yeah, I, I think that's where you catch it, is it? But that, but, but what, but, but if you leave, they could accidentally move two feet forward. Well, I know, but here's, here's if, they, if that foundation is measured, and it's right, and they pour the cement, it's probably going to get built there. 
Yeah, but here's the problem. This is what we don't do in our building permit process. And this is a different question. This is what we don't do. We don't require a survey. We just require the, the so the builder or the foundation people go out and find the property pins. Now, there is nothing that says that those pins haven't been moved. And it's a federal offense to move a property lot pin. And that's actually happened before in this town. <laughs> but then you're going back to the whole administrative process and the courts and proving all of this stuff. We don't require an actual certified survey that the four pins for that property have been found. And that would cost additional money for that individual building house. Probably Three, four hundred bucks. Uh, yeah. The engineer yeah. this evening. Um, it's five or six. Yeah. yeah. Five or six hundred bucks. Like grand or more. And that's a that's a I don't know if you want to call it a political question or what because we would have builders and you know citizens saying I don't want to you know that's another five hundred six hundred bucks that I have to spend or whatever. And so we we stay away from that. But absent like having that done, there is nothing that's totally certifying when we go out there. So our village engineer. And this process is somewhat going off the, I'm not even gonna say it. I mean, they're going off of those four found lot pins, but that's not concrete from the GPS, and that's not concrete from well, the plans. I, I mean, it's it's within, it, yeah. you know, I likely I, not moved, but, you know, or they could have not found it. it things but if, if the road's sense. there, and the curb and gutter's are there, that's the setback, I mean, I guess my thought is is that if we have engineers go out there before they actually build the house and the foundations there, at that point it is it's, it should be reasonably apparent that it's in compliance or not. And if it's not, then you can have the serve I mean, I don't get the discussion today, but I agree with you something. Um, well I'm saying that that process is done. That, that we do go out and we do measure at the time. Well then I shouldn't have it. I mean I, I guess my thought is it probably wouldn't happen going forward. No, this is this process has been in a long time. I just don't I don't know exactly why it's off two point seven feet, but it is. So And that's measured from the foundation, not from the soffit. Because that'll kick out. <coughs> you know, I don't know how well how you're supposed to measure out the foundation. So we need to change and add a Well we need to not now, that's look at it. in the future. You guys have to look at it. It would not it would not be retroactive to this instance. It wouldn't Include this instance. We just need to approve this and let them close and move on. But in the future, as we move forward, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of things we still need to keep changing um, you know, regarding the village and our process and things along those lines. But I wanted to make you aware of that, and it's the reason why, the background of why you'd be approving this, and the things that I see on it, you know, from time to time in my position, um, from you know day-to-day -day operations that come in through the village hall door and he calls me on you know so all right everybody comfortable with moving forward yep. approve the yep. ordinance yes yes what what problems was it a single lot and it, now, now we're splitting it what what, it's what a, problem is there and because it's a it's a the it's lot six. It's already split. It's, it's already split. split. Well, okay. It's a duplex it's, lot. It's a right. zero lot, lot line. In, so the, in the middle. Have, right. So right. we needed. So somebody's <laughs> buying the east half and somebody's buying the west half. So we needed the survey so we knew where the east half was and the west half. Okay. Was. So that's what it, it, it's. So that's it's currently it. lot ten. Now it's going to be lot ten A and ten B. So yes. That's what we're going to do. Okay. Right. So in yeah. on Pintail, I think almost probably ninety five percent of those are all owner. Occupy. They're duplexes, but owner purchased, you know, Both sides. sold. Yes. Yeah. And a lot okay. of them are duplexes. Yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, you just have one yeah. individual who owns it, and people rent from that person. Well, so yeah. this pops when one side. This really shows up when one side goes for sale too. I right. understand cold is actually the hardest part because you got an arc, and you got to figure out where you're going to measure it. That's always the issue. Yeah. Okay. So we need a motion to approve the ordinance and variance from the setback for property located at 339 and 341 Pintail Drive in Sherman, Illinois. Is there a motion to that effect? Trustee Schultz makes a motion seconded by Trustee Gray. Would the clerk please call the roll? Trustee Gray? Yes. 
Trustee Long? Yes. Trustee Long? Yes. Trustee Rocker? Yes. Trustee Schultz? Yes. Trustee Tim? Yes. Six members voting yes, none voting no. The variance will be so favorably reported and signed by the village president, and we can initiate the paperwork to the title company and such. Okay, so that's going to move us to committee and department reports, of which there are none. <coughs> Chief uh, Banger is in attendance. Do you have anything to report <coughs> to the Sherman Police Department? Just real quick, uh, people go and make a note of. Uh, we agreed to host the uh, Sheriff Campbell and the Sangamon County Police Chiefs uh, for a breakfast meeting at the Eastern Green Community Center on March 15th. Uh, the Sheriff hosts a uh, meeting every other month, and all the Sangamon area police chiefs attend. Um, and he's done something different this year where he's kind of been going out to the county municipalities instead of hosting at the Sheriff's Office. That way he kind of gets out in the community and they kind of tail ends it with a, a little town hall meeting so that he opens it up to the public so that they can come and meet for a half hour or an hour with uh, local law enforcement and the sheriff's office and, you know, for transparency and talk an opportunity for the public to ask questions and things of that nature. So uh, we're looking to do that on March 18th. Um, what and, time do you uh, we'll have a We'll have a breakfast meeting at 8 and then the town hall will probably be at 9, 9.30 <coughs> for, like I said, a half hour. We'd also like to do an open house at the same time, and that way when the chiefs are done with the breakfast, we can send them over to the police department to showcase uh, our facility and officers and vehicles and uh, the EMA uh, operations center at the police department. Um, so we're looking forward to doing that. I've already communicated that with uh, Director Mills from emergency management, and we'll have some people in attendance as well. And then also, I just wanted to touch on, uh, it was on the, the website here recently that I accepted an appointment to the uh, Central Illinois Association of Law Enforcement Executives. Uh, it's an association I've been involved with for a number of years, and uh, they had some vacancies that they were to on the executive board, so I submit for that, and we're looking forward to serving on that. Congratulations. 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 Any questions? No. management, nothing on public works. There is no new business, there is no old business, there's no civic organizations on the agenda. Public comment, we have nobody who's signed in to address the board. It's going to bring us to executive session. There is no executive session, so that brings us to the adjournment resolution. Uh, starting off 2020, 44-minute meeting. I promise you we will not have these so many times in the future. <laughs> Try and keep back our mark. Uh, old pathway. The new clerk wants very short. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that being said, is there a motion to adjourn? Trustee Ray makes a motion, taken by Trustee Rockford. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, you guys have it. We're adjourned at 644. Thank you, everybody.